you guys so let's get let, let's see what, what is this video is this new video from magnus carlson it's um and it is uh this is about magnus it says magnus gets real about his future in this must watch interview okay we have closed uh, i don't know do we need closed captions probably not um let's, let's let me let me make my head a little bit smaller um i think actually you're supposed to be bottom left if i remember so if i'm looking looking this way i'm looking that no it should be the other way actually it should be like this okay there we go all right let's go let's watch this ready to give up chess <laughs> altogether you're only given 30 seconds to make the decision and, and okay. perform the shot you've been on top of the game now for more than a decade what how do you stay motivated we are here at the amazing olympus disc golf course in the beautiful florida mountains it's the chess.com disc golf invitation sorry wait a second first of all i need closed captions secondly right on cue i'm i'm sorry can some of the beautiful florida mountains I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I've, I've lived in Florida. I'm sorry. Uh, someone want to tell me what the Florida mountains are? I've never heard of the Florida mountains. Uh, but anyway, whatever. Who cares? Um, yeah, yeah. Flor Florida mountains is a little bit suspicious. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, Florida mountains. Anyway, let's keep going. To my right, the greatest disc ever doing in chess. Okay. To my left, the greatest ever doing in disc golf. We're going to have a blast. We're going to dive into some now, disc golf and some first chess. First things, I'm going to assume that disc golf is probably a, a legitimate sport, unlike pickleball, because I'm betting that this guy, if he's a six-time champion, that means that like he's legitimately the best. I know like, in pickleball, the best pickleball is another sport that I think is relatively new, and the best players in the world can actually just like lose to someone who's not particularly good. So I'm guessing that um I i'm guessing that this is actually a legit sport ask questions right now okay that's one of the best turbos i've ever seen so really here we go guys you ready for some questions have some fun it is legit okay okay magnus we're gonna start with you and ask a question that i'm sure you've been asked before about when you got into chess but because we're gonna talk about these niche sports i want to ask when did chess become more than a hobby for you and you knew it was going to be something that might consume the rest of your life well, chess is still a hobby to me. Okay. <laughs> as, as well as uh, a passion and, and work. Sometime mm -hmm. in my teens, like early teens, I realized that I can be really good at this. And I started contemplating actually having a uh, career in, yeah. in chess, being a professional. And I guess I decided finally when I was 16 that I was not going to pursue school after high school. And this was going to be... Um, what I do for the mm -hmm. future. Yeah, I, I asked that question because I know for, for chess players, it often does start young. And I wanted to then go on to the disc golf side and say, same question to you. When did it become more than a hobby and did it also start young for you? I mean, honestly, the exact same age. Okay. Yeah, so 16, I started disc golf when I was 14. And uh, about okay. 16, my amateur career was coming to an end and I went professional at the end Wait. of 2000. They, they, they have an amateur for this they they actually this is like i i just I assume this was like a new i thought this was a relatively new thing so this guy was like started when he was 14 so i'm guessing he's not that old so i thought this was a sport that originated like in the mid mid to late 2000s so just after turning 17 okay. that's really when you know the the hobby turned into the sport and uh really carried it on from there it's not new at all okay at time, okay didn't really have a real big professional scene so yeah. it it boomed really okay a career until until i won my first world championship in uh 2000 and uh 2012 so just after 2012 training. okay what does that look like when you transition from something being a hobby to a profession what's the training regimen how does that even if it wasn't totally in your teens maybe early 20s but what would you describe as the things that defined it being more than a hobby i think the sacrifice is the biggest thing not seeing friends not seeing family and with disc golf it's traveling so much ah. throughout the country and then finally around the world with uh, the courses growing and the sport growing for you magnus speaking of sacrifice what does that look like to be the exact the greatest, same thing as chess. chess player of all time what what did you have to sacrifice to pursue that i never felt like i had to sacrifice too much in the sense that i, I do also travel uh, a lot for for chess so I guess that is the biggest sacrifice like the 
time that I've got. But see, this is one thing that I alluded to earlier as well, just to point out something for you guys. This is one thing I alluded to, like for the perspective of where you grow up playing chess is very, very different. So like if you grew up playing chess in Europe, you're traveling within Europe. Europe, I mean, as a continent, of course, it's quite big. But if you're traveling within Europe, it's not that far. Like if you go two hours to say Germany or say two hours to like maybe three hours to like London or something, like it is far, but it's not that far. Whereas like for Americans in chess, you almost, you almost have to go to Europe. So like the whole perspective of like traveling is so, so different depending on where you're from as far as chess goes. So, so different, so completely different. To spend uh, at home, but it's it's never felt that way. It's It's been something that I that I wanted to do. Also over time, I've become like a little bit pickier with the tournaments that I mm -hmm. play so that I travel a bit less in periods where I don't necessarily want to do that too much. But I still felt like I've had time to be at home with friends family you know to to build uh, lasting bring bonds. the concord so back I feel like yeah i've been really privileged and and lucky overall you and i were watching paul yesterday in the course and we can see the details that he sees or we don't see the details he sees details we don't see i want to ask you when you are playing chess what do you feel separates you at times in terms of the details you see from the other competitors that you face i guess it's sort of the sort of the same that people have more or less the same tools uh to play even though like you have certain techniques that you prefer i think my decision making is a bit is a bit better but mm -hmm. why that is i'm not <laughs> completely sure my my evaluations are generally a bit better that comes and i i can give you guys the, the 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 plain answer at least as i at least as i perceive this um i know we're on a slight delay so the questions aren't at the exact same time but if you were to ask me what magnus is better at he is better at decision making but that's because he has like this he has this like intuitive sense or feel for pawn structures and end games that other players don't have like it's just something that he possesses that nobody else has um that's the first thing the second thing as far as evaluations go as we've seen and i've said this many times over the last couple of years magnus when you see the heart rate monitors magnus is calmer than everybody else like his heart rate is always lower than everybody else even when the game gets tense which means that just being a little bit calmer a little bit less emotional that that also just helps him tremendously versus um ver versus a lot of other players with experience intuition but i cannot I cannot tell like exactly what it is that I do like a little bit, little little, little bit better. But I feel like I'm kind of decent at everything, and yeah. most people have like at least one phase of the game where they're not as good. It makes sense. So Magnus and his opponents have the same pieces. You and your opponents have the same tools, like he said, the same gist. So can you speak to what is it? What is the details? The so he's a psychopath. The Come on, relax. You, gives you an edge against the other competitors. I think it's that, the decision making. Um, when you have that pressure, when you step up to the shot, you're only given 30 seconds to make a decision and, and perform the shot. So it's, you gotta be kind of quick in that aspect. And then also having all the shots, whether it's backhand, forehand. Wow, 30 seconds is really short. That's like no time, right? That's like really, really short. Like you, you throw it, you only have 30 seconds. That's pretty brutal, actually. Reading the wind and all, the, all these little details, but it's calming those nerves on each shot as well coming from baseball that's my background is just reaction 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 so once i pick a shot i'm just going with it and not thinking about second guessing my shot so i think that's what's really helped me through the years the confidence um, the, the confidence definitely helps not second guessing myself yeah. once mm. i once i make my decision on what i'm doing i'm going with it sticking with it and then you know can i ask a that. question like yeah. how much do you use stats to make your decisions let's say there's a one meter gap <laughs> do you know how often you can can make those shots so not that exact stat for me like a backhand is probably my more preferred shot so if i see like three different gaps i'll give a percentage to them like this gap yeah. i'm gonna hit 70 percent of the time this one 30 percent of the time this one okay 10 percent of the time however you know however i want to break it down i know that was 110 but um however i want to break it down and i'll usually take the higher percentage shot and then i know putting i'm very confident in putting so if i can get into like a 10 meter circle i'm gonna take the one that puts me in the 10 meter circle more often uh, uh, because that's you know the percentages are, are are better that way instead of just trying to put it under the basket every time you say you choose the one that you're more confident do you ever have stats or thoughts on like oh this was a bad shot i, I hit last time do you, are you is that ever in the back of your mind or how do you keep that stuff mm. out, of, out of the back of your mind it is really hard to not jump back to your past your yeah. past rounds and, yeah. and your past faults but you also want to grow from that and i know when you guys watched yesterday there were two shots that 
were probably like a 5% gap, and I wouldn't normally take them, but those were my only options. Yeah. Magnus, mm. what is the chess correlation of that? I mean, is it like an opening you avoid, or do you, what do you do to keep any losses or bad experiences you've had out of your mind when you're moving on to the next game? I was, I was just going to say that I, it was so fascinating for me to see <laughs> Mag like, is confused. The constant decisions you have to make of risk reward. Yeah. There, there is like some of that um, in, in chess, like you want minimal risk and maximum reward, of course. Uh, that's not always so uh, so easy. There is some of that in chess that if there's an opening which I know is good, but it leads me to the a kind of position where I failed before, like then it can become an irrational fear. And for some people, even for me sometimes, I'd stay away, even though I know that, even though mm -hmm. I know it's objectively good because I have this irrational fear of playing there which will make me play worse so uh, so like instead of fixing the problem mm -hmm. i just try and um try and avoid it try to avoid the is that is there a correlation to that you you know this is the right angle to take because you need this line but last time you did it was a bad drive and you got to do it again and, and take the right approach even though you may be a little bit nervous about what happened last time yeah there's definitely moments like that um and then there's also moments where we, we call them like hero shots, where it's like mm. you just want to get the crowd behind you and you want them to cheer. Even though it's not the highest percentage shot, you just want to throw that disc as hard as you can and make it fly as far as it can and just get the, the show going. And that's actually a question I have for Magnus. Like, is there Your moments like move? that? Yeah, is there like a hero <laughs> move in, in chess like that? No, well, the problem is I'm I'm really pragmatic when it comes to chess, at least in the tournaments that I, um, that I really want to do well, then I do everything to, to maximize results. Um, yeah, th this is a, this is actually like uh, I, I've said it before. And I'll say it again. Like the absolute top chess players, like chess at the top level, is very much it's it's, it's effectively like being a, a being a risk manager. It's like it's like managing risk. That's like what being an absolute top chess player is all about. Um, is is being a risk, be, be understanding risk, assessing it, and how to, how to deal with it. I'm really the opposite of a crowd pleaser, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, you've done well. You've both done well, and I want to get to a question now about. How do you stay motivated? You just mentioned your first world championship was won in 2012. It was 12 years ago. You've been on top of the game now for more than a decade. How do you stay motivated? That's poker too? Like, okay. Like motivation is here and there. Um, it, it's really the discipline part that's, that's hard, uh, but I love it and, and try to stay as disciplined as possible. There's always something that I can get better at. And uh, I just actually had my first child back in October. So now that's like a, something that's even more fun because I want to be on top while he's growing up. Yeah. Um, so mm. it's, it's something that uh, is really pushing me, driving me, injuries, coming back from them. I want to, you know, prove a lot of people wrong, but I also want to prove to myself that I can get through this and continues. But Magnus, same to you, man. I mean, you've been doing it for maybe two decades now on top of the chess world. How do you stay motivated? It's kind of similar. That motivation, motivation comes and goes. Just last week, I played a tournament where during the course of the tournament, I was ready mm. to give up chess <laughs> altogether. At, I'm bobbing to the, the music. End. I'm bobbing to this background music. I, was, I love this game and I want to play forever. At some point you, re you realize that it's hard to be like 100% all the time. I know that I my best level is as good as it's ever been. Uh, but I also know that I don't have the energy and the motivation to be there all the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it comes and goes a little bit. Sometimes I get, you know, oh, bum, a bit bum, like bum. a daisical, and then I start uh, losing a couple of games, and then I get really motivated again. Yeah. <laughs> As Paul said, like discipline for me, especially during tournaments, like that's the biggest thing. I know that even if I'm doing poorly, if I stay disciplined and do do the right things then things will turn turn around um, eventually. Mm -hmm. I hear you guys both use the word discipline. It made me think of one of the things I was watching yesterday is that chess players have their disciplines, their routines. Disc, disc golf pros also clearly have the way they approach the shot, the way they walk up and look. Are there any superstitions that disc golfers have? Do you ever notice them doing something exactly the same way after they had a good shot or what can you what can you say about that? There's definitely superstition. Uh, I think each player has their has their own. Uh, I'm trying to think if if I have one specifically. I definitely have a routine. I don't know. I don't have a superstition that comes to mind right now. Okay. And it could change. They can come and go. Chess players have uh, superstitions for sure. Step on the line. Yeah, yeah. 
here I, I can't think of one exactly what's or, your, what's your pre-shot routine um, on, the, on the tee for instance on the tee I'll, I'll walk up to the tee I'll kind of visualize my line so I'll walk up and kind of go through the motions of what, what my footwork will kind of be and then just mm. get my arm motion out there um, and spotting where I want to throw and finding like that apex point in my shot and putting it's more so the routine is get your breath under like under control and just kind of timing it um, and then it's more of a feel when when am I comfortable when am I ready to go mm-hmm. uh, it's not exactly the same every time but I also like to look at it like a free throw in basketball when I'm putting I love it Magnus mm-hmm. any thoughts on that the routine superstitions chess players have chess players your, have your superstitions mind, your breath under control and pressure moments I was thinking about the same same thing that uh, that's what I do whenever I'm in I'm in time pressure I try and you know focus on my breath for for a little bit if that doesn't work i'm probably gonna um, i'm probably too uh tired or excited to to play well anyways but um, but a little bit of but even if magnus is too excited and, and he, he loses control his heart rate is still not 170 like fabiano's was during that uh, match against levon what you do is sort of subconscious like i'm sitting at the board and it feels like suddenly some like it's almost an unconscious decision like okay i have to move like or but but usually it's sort of at the end of a process but it's it's not the same every every time for sure well this has been awesome i have a final question for both you you won your first world championship 2012 magnus won his in 2013 basically been on top now for the same amount of years will you both be on top in 10 more years i'd love to be on top in 10 more years i want to play for 10 more years and I'm competitive, so if I'm not showing up to a tournament with the the goal to win, then why show up? Ten more years is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Um, no, as I said, like my, my motivation comes and goes a little bit, but basically I still love to play. So I'm going to continue to play for at least a few more years. If I'm showing up for a tournament to be uh, tenth, this was not a must-watch. No, it's fine. <laughs> All right, well, there you have it—the mindsets of a couple of goats. They'll be doing it, I think, for 10 more years and likely be on top. And thank you for for tuning in. For those of you who watched Mm -hmm. the Chess.com Invitational on the Disc Golf Professional Tour, and we'll see you around on Chess.com. Yeah, so anyway, that was was a pretty light video, not super crazy, of course, um, uh, on, on all that.